hello to all of you zooming in from Illinois, California, and other parts of the world. We're pleased to welcome you to the Women Echo Artist Dialogue, Art and Healing Number Six, to spotlight the work of legendary echo feminist painter and performance artist Fern Schaefer, and join her presentation, Healing the Earth, a Pilgrimage of How I Got to Where I Am. WEED was founded in 1996 as a volunteer-run collective of female-identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersection of art and ecological issues. Fern is an important WEED seed artist working in the field for many years. I am Mary Apicos, and I will be your host for today. We will begin with the land acknowledgement for Chicago. Fern is presenting from Chicago. The towns of North Chicago reside on the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, once used by nomadic tribes who shared the Algonquin culture and language. By 1760, Potawatomi villages populated this land. This land was recorded as being transferred from the local Potawatomi community to the U.S. government in the 1829 Treaty of Prairie du Chien. The government then sold the land to white settlers. We are delighted to introduce Fern Schaefer as an American painter, performance artist, lecturer, and environmental advocate. Her work arose in conjunction with an emerging eco-feminist movement that brought together environmentalism, feminist values, and spirituality to address shared concern for the earth and all forms of life. She first gained widespread recognition for a nine-part shamanistic performance cycle created in collaboration with photographer Otello Anderson in 1985. Writer and critic Susie Gavlik praised their work for its rejection of the technocratic, rationalizing mindset of modernity in favor of commuting with magic, mysterious, and primordial, and the soul. Gavlik featured Schaefer's Winter Solstice in 1985 as the cover art for her influential book, The Reenchantment of Art, and wrote that the ritual opened, quote, a lost sense of oneness with nature and an acute awareness of the ecosystem that offered a possible basis for reharmonizing our out of balance relationship with nature. Schaefer is also known for feminist and echo and ecology themed paintings that critics have described as romantic, dizzying and panoramic, spiritual, and capable of combining the scientific, personal, and the universal. She has been a longtime advocate for women in art through her involvement and leadership at the Chicago Alternative Art Space Artemisia Gallery and work with the National Women's Art Caucus for Art. In addition to exhibiting work throughout the United States, she has exhibited internationally. Most recently, her nine-year ritual work was included in the 2023-2024 show, Re-Sister, a lens on gender and ecology at the Barbican Center in London. In addition to her work as an artist, Schaefer has served on the advisory board of the New Art Examiner as program director of the Humanities Institute in Chicago and as chairwoman in that city's Department of Cultural Affairs. For the past 30 years, she has been program director at Self Help Home, a senior living community originally founded to help refugees and survivors of the Holocaust to find community and rebuild their lives. Hi, I'm so grateful for the invitation to present my work to you and thank you 
lead for our invitation. We're going to start in 1981, and this is my really my first exhibition at Artemisia Gallery, and this is when I joined them. And uh, these are wall hangings, and they're pretty big, um, maybe 10 feet across, 8 feet in length. And this is red, which is for blood and for life. This is yellow after everything has died. This is really a symbol of death because all the green is gone from all the plant life. And this one is black, and that is for the future, the unknown. This is the installation of all three of them. When I exhibited this at Artemisia Gallery, they voted me in as a member, and my life had changed. Um, the next series. So this series is about exploring myself. Who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? Um, my life has changed again. I had three small children at home, and I now they're all in school, and I have time to go back to my true love. Um, so these are figures of myself. And this one is made of pennies, and that was because I was always worried about money. Being sing single again and having to get my kids through college and all of those problems weighed me down. And here is confronting my spiritual self, one side versus the other side, trying to have a conversation with myself. Here's in prayer mode. And the energy is coming from within my body. There's energy around me all the time. And something strange happens along the way. The paintings take on their own life. And I no longer can contain any of that inside of me. It was falling out. I couldn't control it. I couldn't hang on to it. So these were pictures and the images came so fast to me that I switched to paper. The paper is five feet tall. Um, so that I can catch the ideas as they were coming. And then the final outcome is a six foot painting. I think it's maybe it's five by seven um, where I am reaching out into the environment my whole being is totally empty, and I'm trying to find what's out there for us. So here is standing at the line, making a decision. Do I step in? Do I turn around and walk away? Um, and I stepped in. This is the next series of paintings, and now we're up to 1985, and these are large paintings. They're eight by 15 feet, because I felt as a woman that we could do that. Men were all painting very large paintings at the time, and I said, I can do that. I can work small, and I can work big. And the images that came to us really a story. This is called A Tribe. Um, Beyond the Cave is the name of the series, but this is A Tribe. Then the same size, eight by 15 feet. This is a confrontation. There's always a confrontation. We have a group of people. And the confrontation, so no more. And this is a 20 foot painting. And this is the isolation of being the only one left of your tribe is kind of frightening. And then after that person is gone, there is nothing. And the story repeats itself continuously. This is the installation. I come up with another series of paintings, and these are 10 foot tall. And this is about, I would say, 1986. 87. And there are all these doorways that are open to me. So this one's about Egyptology. 
and this is the universal peace, the universal Indian peace sign. This is um, the Kabbalah and using the DNA of life. And these are the three races. And those are me basically in my costume. The series then came up, they're 10 feet tall, and it was in gold arches. I, I have, at this time, a few years earlier, have committed myself to being concerned about the environment and not painting unless I have something to say, some sort of context that would bring me back to what I'm concerned about. So this is the greenhouse effect paintings. Um, when it gets very stormy in Chicago, I have a tendency to see that greenish side. As it gets worse, it gets darker and darker. And then it's so dark you can't see or breathe. And these are eight by fifteen feet also. As I continue into my studies into my sub contact, I was leaving the studio and I saw these shiny things in the uh, garbage. And of course, I'm attracted to anything that glitters and is shiny. And I looked at them and they were slides of diseased parts of the body. And I just couldn't, I put threw it away and go, oh, this is uh, horrible. And I went home and I couldn't sleep. And of course, I had to get up early the next morning before the, the garbage people came. And I took as many of these slides upstairs to the studio. I mean, tons of them, hundreds of them. And then I sorted them. So my whole studio became about all of these sick parts of our body. And there were very few, um, very few examples of any kind of belonging to women. So I, I deducted that this is probably left over the Korean War. So there were all of these drawings. I figured out how to glue the painting onto canvas and then paint around it. The problem with this subject matter is that number one, it was very depressing. And number two, people were, refuse, were refusing to come to the studio to come visit me or see what I was working on. And I kept getting more depressed. What I really wanted to do was to hang um, portraits view these objects that were in your body as part of a portrait. So I bought gold frames and I hung it like there'd be a wall of the kidney and there'd be a wall of the, of the heart. But I decided that I was going in the wrong direction. It was just that simple. I was not doing the right way. I, it was wrong. So I stopped totally, packed it all up, never exhibited it, and to healing, healing the plants need to be acknowledged for what they've given to us. And I spent the next 20 years dealing with healing plants. So this is the ginkgo plant. And um, as you know, the ginkgo is familiar with giving you memory and um, other things, which I can't remember. So, uh, and this is ferns. And um, this is about ferns to heal your digestive system. This is digitalis. Digitalis is good for um, irregular heartbeats and epidemic tuberculosis. And I painted them as icons, basically something to be chipped. This is cannabis, and I think most of you know all the benefits of cannabis. Um, this one is Artemisia, and I was excited to paint an Artemisia plant because it's named 
after Artemisia or Artemisia is named after it. And it's good for diseases of the stomach. This one is the lungwort. And this is used for cough medicines and lung disease. And this is gopher wart, which is um, good for corn, boils, cancer. Then I have another idea that I thought I would like to create a tree. And I started working on plants, but it's very small, three by four inches. And I was painting them on these squares and painting and painting. I accumulated quite a few of them. And then I tried to hang them and figure out how to put them as a tree and it didn't work. It just didn't work for me. So I ended up scaling up a little bit. These are eight by 10 inches. And this is all about the ginkgo. And it's in a grid that I, I just loved it. So it worked for me. Ate all these birds. Um, so the the thing that when I was asked to represent to paint and paint them, the only thing that was really left to the birds was the DNA, and so that's what I concentrated on was the DNA. I worked with the Tello Anderson, who was also a painter. He was a photographer for all the ritual photographs that we did. And we decided to tackle uh, a 20 foot painting. And it was very interesting to work with somebody and I paint something and he paints something and then we adjust the paintings. And we really, it was, it was fun. It was fun to work on something so large. So this was about man's presence in the forest. Here's the forest by itself. Also man's presence in the forest, the boat, is an indication that there's humans on the planet now. This is the Antarctic. And this one is the desert. And this is spring. And these are all 20 feet. And this one is the fall. And this wood is the wetlands. And this is taken from life of photographs that we go out and take pictures of and then transmit them to a canvas and paint them. The next series that we're at is starting with the pandemic. During the pandemic, I had to close my studio because it was just didn't make any sense to pay rent on a studio and then travel back and forth. And at this time, my cousin Sheldon, uh, who meditates, went to India to visit his guru. And when he came back, he told me this story about how his guru could not figure out if he wanted to celebrate his 80th birthday or 1,000 full moons. And I said, a thousand full moons, that's incredible. I couldn't, it wouldn't leave me alone. So I made Sheldon a gift for his birthday that came up years later of a thousand moons in watercolor. And it, it formed into a book, it was lovely. And I thought that I would be done, but I'm not. So the thousand moons wouldn't leave me alone. And the moons became more of a way to record the time. And what does time look like? And this would be 80 years of time. That's a thousand moons. And the moons have, lead, have 29 colors that have been recognized and written down. 
And so that gave me permission to experiment a little bit more freely with the colors of the moon. When they talk about a blue moon, it's not necessarily the moon is blue. It's just that there's two full moons in the same month. And here are things. So the project was really huge for me um, because that meant I had to order a thousand pieces of canvas all at one time because I wanted the color to be the same and from the same manufacturer. Then I had to rent a store space and where this is store this. And then I had to figure out how I was going to paint them and how and which way and how to do it. Um, so I figured out that I, I can't hand paint all the stars. So I learned how to flicker my toothbrush filled with paint and captured backgrounds and then painted the blue colors on top. This is an installation, partial installation. This is about 50 moons. And that person in there is to show you the scale. And then I did a mock-up, which is to show anyone how it would look in a gallery. And this is how it works at home. This is where I'm talking to you from my little private studio, one of the bedrooms of my apartment. And I was able to work on 20 and 30 at a time. And I have completed over a thousand paintings of full moons, which are back into storage and I'm looking for a place to exhibit them. Thank you. And then we're gonna go on to the Now we're going to start with the rituals. This ritual was about fire and ice and snow, and I'm wearing a black costume. These are the, I'm just giving you a few samples of the rituals they performed before we started the nine year ritual. And this is, and something always magical or unusual happens with all of the rituals that we go out to do and this was setting fire and once the fire ring was totally completed and that we shoot with about 20 rolls of film now we're using film during all of the rituals and digital wasn't happening at the time no other film developed there was 20 roles except for five or six photos they were all black so that was a ritual that really didn't want to be recorded the next one we did was about an indian mound in wisconsin and i used um I mean, canvases that were painted these were atello was painting um the galaxies at that time so it wanted a universal approach and um, we went out into the, the woods and I realized after doing this particular canvas um, that it was heavier. When you paint the canvas and cut it up, it's much heavier than raw canvas. So I learned a lot of things. So, and I brought all of my shamanistic materials with me, a drum and, and we did burning of sage and, everything else that's needed. This is a ritual having to feed the forest. So I'm in red being in life and passing out corn, I forget what it's called. It was just corn, ground up corn, cornmeal. That's what I'm looking for, cornmeal. 
them pouring cornmeal into the forest for it to heal. The next ritual that we did was in the city. I had never actually done one in the city. And if you look at this particular side, you could slide, you can see the rats jumping out. So it was a rat infested garbage site and I'm in bubble wrap. And the truth is I hated putting bubble wrap on. I usually have no clothes on underneath this. So I'm totally connected to the earth, but bubble wrap, all plastic, it draws dirt to it. So I was feeling very crummy from this. And usually we don't have too much attention, but here a truck pulled up and stood and stopped and watched the whole thing it was there. It was really amazing. This is in Chicago when we had ice storms. And, um, and this is one of the pictures that Susie Gablick, I invited Susie Gablick after reading Has Modernism Failed to Chicago to speak at Artemisia. And she said, could she come to the studio? I said, of course. So she came to the studio and I was painting the arch paintings, which she really didn't care for at all. But she saw these photographs on the table and says, what is this? What are you doing? And I said, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing this. And um, she loved it. And that's how it ended up on the front of her book. Now I said to Otello, I really would like to make a deeper commitment to what we're doing. Could we make a ritual that would last for nine years? And could we agree to it? And we did, we worked it all out and we were both working, we had jobs. So we would plan the rituals or basically our vacation time when we needed to do the next ritual. And in this case, we were gonna shoot someplace in Chicago, but we got an invitation from James Hillman to appear in um, a small conference that he was doing in Esalant, California. So we said, yes. If that's where we have to be, then that's where the ritual will take place. And this was it on the ocean. And it was to acknowledge the importance of the water to us, the fish and what we eat. So um, these were at Esalon. They took place February 9th, 1996 on the Pacific Ocean at Big Sur, California. It was, the purpose was to reflect our concern for water and their sea is the source of life. The following year was in Mineral Point, Wisconsin. This was about the food and how important the food is to us and the chemicals that they're pouring into the food. Um, this was one of the hardest ones that I ever did because the wind was so strong and I'm walking on icicles, basically icicles. And every place I turned, I was tangled up. The costume would get mixed up into the When this ritual ended, I knew that I had absorbed an awful lot of poison into my system, just being out there. I had to stop someplace to get into a hot tub to like drain it out of me before we could even go home. It wasn't that it was so far away. Chicago was only maybe three hours away, but my health was really important and so we did. The fourth ritual was about going to West Virginia to the Appalachian Mountains because what they were doing there was blowing up the mountains and filling in the valleys to get to the coal. Well, that's wrong. It's really wrong. And we're at the top of one of the mountains here and it's raining. And when we start the ritual, it stops raining exactly one hour. And um, 
like I always say to Tello, just if I fall, don't run and try and capture me. Just continue taking the pictures and we'll go on from there. So, um, but I was very fortunate. And this is in April 9th, 1998, on the summit of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. The following year was 1999, and I knew that I had to go to uh, the Death Valley. That was just really important. Certain signs come to me or certain information, all of a sudden you just know what to do. So we needed to go here. So I was lucky enough to have written a grant and gotten money because this was a fly drive situation. We had to fly to Las Vegas, then get a car and go to Death Valley. And we spent five days in searching for the right location to do the ritual. And this is changing from one century to another. And the costume has elements of the industrial age. Nuts and bolts are sewn into the costume. We're leaving the industrial age going into the digital age. And I could see being here how stagecoaches misinterpreted this land to be solid and straight. It's horrible to walk on and be in this ups and downs and I could see wagon wheels being broken. That's probably why they called it Death Valley. The next ritual. The next ritual is takes place in Ontario, Canada. And this is in June 9th, 2000. The old growth forest in Canada is so different than the old growth forest in the United States. Here, the growing season is basically six weeks. So the tree that you see behind me is a hundred, hundreds of years old, but it only has six weeks to grow in every year. In California, the trees are eight, 10 feet wide because they have growing season all year round. But it was very important. The other thing that I learned about, this is not going to Canada in this month because it's Black Fly Month and mosquitoes. They were crawling all over the place. And this particular land that we're at was an island, so we had to rent a boat to get us there. And I said to this driver, don't you dare move. You're going to stay here till we are finished. And it was really horrible. It was the environment was just really tough to, to deal with. That happens sometimes. But once I'm inside the costume, I'm, I'm gone from the earth mentally. I'm, I'm dealing with other issues. So, um, This issue, this ritual is the seventh, and this is the headwaters of the Mississippi River. It's amazing that this mighty Mississippi River starts from a small lake, a small pond. There must be a natural water source here. Um, but this is the beginning of the Mississippi River. And it's really important that we acknowledge the rivers and the waters. We need all of this to exist. The next ritual took place in um, Greenpoint, Newfoundland. I wanted to go to the closest place I could to the Atlantic Ocean. And this is this is as far into the Atlantic Ocean as we could go that had land. And in this particular series, I slipped. My foot fell between two rocks and I could not move because if I moved, I would fall and that would have broken my leg. 
So I was trying to get Atello's attention and he thought I was just continuing with my ritual of dancing. But eventually he figured out that I needed help and he came and we, um, I put on my boots and went back out there and it was a little bit better situation to deal with. And the last ritual was at the Cache River Basin. We went down to Southern Illinois. We wanted to go to the Evergreens, but everything is related to the amount of money that you have to use at the time you're doing something. And it would have been five hour, five days to drive to the, you know, Florida from Chicago. And then I needed five days to come back. We just didn't have the time to do that. So I found this place, word of mouth, someone told me about the Cash River Basin. And the minute I saw this, I fell in love with this location. Everything about it was so magical. And I said to Tello, we have to go to the Walmart because I have to get boots. I'm going in. And, I, and it says, please don't kill the snake. So I didn't want to step on anything that would bite me. So we went to the Walmart. As with every ritual, there's always problems and things to set up. In this particular case, we were in deep south, and my car breaks down, and they can't repair it. I have it to have it towed 100 miles to Carbondale, and I'm in the car shop, and I call my accountant. I said, I have to buy a car. Here, talk to the, the woman, um, and we left with a new car. And I had to go back to the place that we were taking the pictures, and I went in. And I took this costume home, which was wet, and I hung it up in the studio. It took almost two years for it to dry. But I loved as the dirt and the essence of the of this place fell on the floor, and I would sweep it up and put it away. I just loved the way it smelled and everything about it. And that... is the last of the rituals. And I thank you all very much for paying attention and listening to me. And um, thank you, Weed, for the invitation.